Today, I'm interviewing Jackie Ultra. Okay, I don't want to say I'm the happy wrong either thing. way. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's start right at the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about your early years. I, I understand your childhood was a bit troubled. I guess, yeah. I, I don't think you know much about your childhood um, while it's happening. I think you only learn about your childhood in retrospect when you start meeting other people and go, oh, like, wow, that wasn't so normal. So um, I don't speak to either of my parents anymore. Um, my mother used to beat me with bamboo, the feather duster, the wooden spoons, and then get even more angry when they broke. So. I had a, um, a pretty early education in caning. Um, the bamboo was green and it used to split on your ass, which actually hurt more than a cane. Um, my father beat me with the buckle end of the belt. Um, so I had a kind of, I, I guess, I had a lot of people trying to break my spirit when I was a kid. Um, and I had this, because I had a sister who was born um, and stopped breathing, um, so she got a disability. Um, and I think when you have two children, there's usually one that's the good one and one that's the bad one. I was the bad one. Um, and my sister was painted white. Everything that she did was good. So um, I, I grew up thinking that I must be a bad person um, and that I obviously needed eventually to leave my um, suburban life and find other bad people who I thought would be painted black like me. But you said even though these objects would break, you were the child who wouldn't break. What did that mean? Oh yeah, I'd say it didn't hurt. Even if I was crying, I'd say it didn't hurt, didn't hurt, didn't hurt. And my mother would, uh, who later as an adult must admitted that I always got 10 more hits than I actually deserved um, because I wouldn't give. Um, I just don't think I knew how to um, give in. I. I just, I fought, like that was my nature. Uh, and I think that she wanted a really ordinary, acquiescent child, and I just wasn't that. Um, and my father, I don't know, I don't recall much parenting from him at all. So, you know, he'd occasionally come in as the authority figure, and of course I wouldn't give in there either, so. Wow. Yeah, but I mean, I didn't know, I mean, this was stuff that you didn't talk about. You didn't talk about it at school. Um, you certainly didn't talk about it with friends, so you didn't know that other kids weren't getting hammered. And it's only when you look back and, and you know, try and make sense of your childhood, you kind of go, oh, that, that isn't what's supposed to happen. But I think that, that Australia certainly had a culture of spare the rod and spoil the child through, through that period. And my mother feels very vindicated in how she parented. Mm. Did other, were other people aware of what was going on in your household or did they ignore it? I don't think it? so. I, I, I genuinely don't think so. Uh, as an adult, I have approached both, you know, other, other family members, so aunts and uncles, and they didn't seem to know and I certainly didn't ask for help. I think maybe they thought that if I'd needed help, I would have asked for it. But I, again, I just didn't know how to. I just went, well, you just have to deal. Like, you get up, you know, you fight. <laughs> That was, my, that was my answer, I suppose. So I guess now they know, <laughs> um, but I guess they have a different relationship with me now. The um, aunts and uncles, you mean? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I pro probably have a better relationship with my cousins because I don't feel like they're all tarred with the same brush, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Like the cousins are kind of, they grew up um, with those parents. It was the parents that didn't help, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly have talked about it. Um, and they certainly knew that stuff at home wasn't great. Um, but nobody said it to me. So I think I, I formed all of the um, analysis about my childhood independently. And I didn't know, I didn't know any different. And then it's really hard to shake your origin stories. Sure. So if you think you're painted black, you go through life going, I'm a bad person. Like you, but I mean, I, I guess I turned it into a positive, but I think that that was a real, it's a really fundamental story to me, yeah.
But as a child, I mean, on a slightly lighter note, as a child, you dreamt about being a cult leader. I did. I, I, I was really that. attracted to dark figures, you know? I mean, it, Hellfire is a cult, if nothing else. Like, I mean, it, it has its rules and it has its costumes. And I mean, those were the kind of people, powerful people, people that, that set, set, what, set how the world would be. Because one of the things I think cult leaders do quite well is they create an alternative set of values. Sure. And I think that that is exactly what I wanted to do with Hellfire. I wanted to make a place where nobody was what the club was about, so everybody fitted in. I wanted to make a place where you could be fat. I wanted to make a place where you could be ugly. And you would find your people. Like Those were, those were really strong values for me. And I think I only saw cult leaders as the kind of people that would get persecuted for trying to tell a whole bunch of people here's a different way that you can live and here are different values and you can have them. Is there one that really stood out to you? Well, I mean, it's really hard to get through Jonestown and them all drinking the great Kool-Aid, but you know, I, I think that you can be a benevolent cult leader. Oh, okay. Like, I don't think you have to. I don't, I don't actually think that cult leaders set out to hurt their people. Outside pressure on their communities is what causes the meltdown. Uh -huh. I mean, you can think about, you know, many of the big meltdowns, like they're all about outside pressure saying, no, no, you're too weird. You can't live like that. Wow. The concept of a benevolent cult leader actually really didn't occur to me. I That's, think that they yeah. love them at the beginning. Yeah. But I also think living differently to everyone else is really tough. It's sure. tough on the psyche. It's tough when you put your photos up on Facebook, for example, and people mock you or laugh at you because you don't look like everybody else. One of the reasons we chose to put Hellfire photos publicly was to try to break down this stigma so people didn't get that when they put up their photos in their outfits. We could have had a private website and we did for many years, but when we thought, no, then we're just letting you all live it alone. Like when, when your friends go, oh, I would never do that. It's like, well, actually it's normal. You mentioned your, your, your people painted black. Yeah. How did you find them in well, your world? <laughs> I think I was 18. <laughs> no, I think I, I was either 18 or 19 and I went, I must find my people. And I thought that they might be bikies or they might be people that went to the Hellfire Club. And Hellfire had started in Sydney in March of 1993. And so I rocked up in blue jeans and a leather vest and... Um, got on the A-frame the first night with the man I later married in, um, also the first man I ever slept with. Um, I'd slept with women up solely up until that point. Um, but um, I just didn't, I, I just went and I didn't even think not to do any of it. I was like, oh, okay, well my people must be here. <laughs> and it was kind of funny because I thought that the people painted black would be really terrible people. But what I found was people who asked before they hit you, um, people that would stop when you wanted them to stop, and that people who had a really strong ethical code, so you actually could trust them and give in and <clears throat> let them hurt you um, because you know that they wouldn't hurt you. And that was actually really substantially different to my family. How did you even know about Hellfire, though? Um, I think it had a big splash when it opened here. Um, it was a, a guy from Melbourne who had fairly questionable politics brought it up and he lasted for about a year. Um, but luckily I didn't meet him, I met Master Tom who I eventually married, but he's a real left wing. So he was all about body positivity, he was all about left wing politics. Um, he was like, no Nazi uniforms here, kind of. So, so that, I think that set the tone for what I thought fetish was. Okay. Um, but I was certainly interested. And I think, um, if I think back, a lot of my sexual fantasies up until that point had perhaps been quite divergent. I do recall having to hop down the, the hallway naked, tied in the curtain cords um, for a knife from the kitchen as quite a, a teenager and having to explain to my mother how her curtain cords got cut. So I think that I had fantasies about being tied up and I had fantasies about, or, I mean, even the cult leader stuff, I'm, I think it all came from movies. And hmm. so I think I had a fairly active fantasy life that wasn't about vanilla sex. Okay. But 
Tell us about your initial experiences with BDSM because you told me that that taught you something amazing about yourself. What was that? I don't know. I, I think initially with BDSM, I found that owning pain is different from unwanted pain. Like that, yes. was, that was perhaps the biggest lesson that if you want to be hit, it is so good compared to if somebody hits you or if you have an accident and hurt yourself. So wanted pain was erotic. Um, yeah. That was perhaps the best thing I learned. I also learned to hit people. That took me a lot. It was hard. Um, I couldn't believe at the beginning that somebody wanted to be hurt because I didn't want to be hurt. <laughs> Or, or I only wanted to be hurt because bad things had happened to me, perhaps. So um, it took me a long time to pick up the whip. Um, and then when I did, I realised that I was kind of being a bit of an asshole with it. I, I didn't, <laughs> like, I didn't have any limits. Like, I knew with the rules, you were supposed to tell me when you'd had enough. And if you weren't, weren't telling me, I'm like, I'm not going to stop. Like, you know, I, I, I don't know, I was arrogant. I was young and arrogant. <laughs> um, so there was a particular man and he really liked me and he wanted, to, he wanted to impress me. And so he would do the doesn't hurt. And I'd be like, I know this is hurting. And eventually I saw myself and went, if I just keep hitting somebody um, because they're too stupid or too proud or trying too hard to say, to use a safe word, I am just as violent as the people in my past. Yeah. So then I think I learnt that you only hit somebody because you love them. And that you need to create that bound of boundary of love before you pick up a whip. So are you saying then that it, it should be something much more intimate between people and not just random? I'm just saying if I'm going to yeah. hurt you, I need to love you. I need to love you as a human and I need oh, okay. to want you to have the best life. Like, and if I, can't, if I can't get that with you, I shouldn't hit you. Okay. okay. And I, it doesn't have to be intimate romantic love but I just have to care what happens to you. I have to care when you don't care okay. because it's me hurting you. Yeah. You know, I'm the one with the weapon and you're tied down. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, I, I guess I learned very clearly what the difference between violence is and BDSM. And I've, I've never forgotten it. You know, I don't, I don't hurt people to cause pain. Do you think that there's a, a, a uh, misunderstanding about that in a lot of the BDSM community? Um, look, I think one of the things I do is book a lot of shows and I often book shows from the community and I feel like sometimes people think they have to get more and more and more extreme to be rebooked. Um, I, I try very hard to talk to people about that we want to see intimacy and we want to see how you play. And if you play with, you know, paint, I mean, I've done a lot of stupid shows like where I dip my whips in fluorescent paint and I whip people and then I make them sit on paintings. And, you know, like I do crap craft shows and they can be as good and as fun and uh, as a show where somebody is putting in flesh hooks. So oh. I, think that, I think that we try to show those values. Um, I, I don't think BDSM has to be a competition to do the most extreme things to your body. And sometimes those are not the shows I enjoy the most. Okay. Well, tell us about the Sydney kink scene that you first encountered. What was it like? All right. Well, when I first... Um, well, first of all, there was Hellfire. Um, there was warehouse parties. Uh, I remember a very early warehouse party where two people were wearing lace underwear and they were dancing over a white, um, a white canvas and they had um, potato whip up their ass in different colours and they were pooping through, the, um, pooping through the panties to create art in high heels. Um, so that was, that, was what, that was my welcome to Helper. Uh, that was my welcome to warehouse parties. My first, my first inquisition I saw, I was dancing. I um, had indulged in some um, entertainments and I saw a double-handed fisting in the middle of the dance floor and I remember looking at it and going, wow, that is so, oh, that's so interesting, but I think I might look at that another time. Okay. <laughs> wow. Um, 
I, yeah, I, I guess I saw it on. And then third, the third memory is, was at a party called Threshold, which actually is a little bit older than Hellfire. And I saw somebody have a champagne enema, and that was quite extreme too. My God. Shit and champagne everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I saw a lot of things, and I, um, you know, I guess you find out where you sit. That, you know, you find out what your fetishes are, but I've always enjoyed watching people do what makes them happy. Within reason in the licensed premises. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how your personal BDSM journey evolved in the community. I think I grew up really quickly as a kid, so I didn't have a great sense of play. So for me, BDSM has always been about playfulness. You know, somebody says, you can't set somebody on fire. I work out how you can, <laughs> you know. Um, I go to Bunnings. So Bunnings is a great um, source of inspiration. And I go and find things that will glow under black light and I make them into bondage implements. For, for the international audience. Oh, is Bunnings yeah. is a massive, massive hardware store. Okay. So yeah, a lot of Hellfire shows developed in Bunnings. Um, like paint, food. Like, uh, I'm the kind of person, like, if I think of an idea... I, I'll execute it. So my subs used to learn to bring a towel to Hellfire. Um, you know, one of them for her birthday, I set up a row of balloons on a string and in each balloon was a different vile substance. And she had to go and sit under a particular balloon. And if she picked the wrong order, it was, you know, maple syrup before flour or... <laughs> so, you know, she'd get, you know, you'd pop the balloon, she'd get the, the cane strokes and then she'd move to the next balloon. So I've always found BDSM is creative and fun. You know, wow. I'm less, you know, and I do like hurting people, don't, you know, and I do like being hurt. So I do like pain, but I, I also like things that are beautiful. I like piercing, so I've pierced feathered wings onto people that glow under black light. Um, I like slime. Slime's awesome. So I made a show where I used, you know, a, a blade to cut veins full of lime, lime green slime. Um, I've done a lot of foot fetish shows where I've used jelly snakes as bondage. <laughs> I made somebody bake a cake with their feet. That was awesome. Um, I did it like one of those cooking shows where I was like, here's a cake we prepared earlier. Now she's going to ice it. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I guess for me, BDSM is not so straight up and down. It's not, it's not as, as serious as it may be depicted. Yeah. But, more but of fun. course, you know, I can flog, I can pierce, I can, I can use fire, I've, uh, electric, electric play. None of the manuals, though, do tell you the thing I found about electric play. Nobody talks about having a tongue piercing so that you go and get your violet wand and you stick the contact pad on and you're licking and you're licking and a spark arcs off your piercing and gives you a massive blister on your tongue. Ah! Go figure. <laughs> How did you learn a lot of this? Experimentation. Do you know what? It's really hard to break somebody or end up in hospital. So just go for it. My gosh. You try. And mostly my rule is you try it on yourself first. So the violet <laughs> wand arrives and you sit there in your house going, what does this feel like and what does this feel like? Oh, okay, I won't do that one. But did you see these things depicted somewhere that you even... Oh, look, I read a lot of books. I read okay. everything that was to read about BDSM. Okay. Um, but then I guess also, I don't know, I, I just experimented. It's about playing with bodies at the end, isn't it? So... I do remember an early partner, I said, what would happen if you put a piercing needle into one of the veins on your penis? And he said, try it. Blood spurted everywhere, but it was oh. good to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is good to know. Like, honestly, it's actually pretty hard to break somebody. You know, you have to really set out to hurt them. My God. You know, so, so you, go to the, you go to the supermarket and you buy 15 types of hair mousse, you smear somebody with honey and you see which one burns. Ah. So, you know, like it's about playfulness. And I think sometimes we forget about the play aspect of it. In all of these rules, what we're doing is having fun. Like we, we're meant to have fun. We're meant to experiment. Incredible. But you put yourself through university. I did. Utilizing BDSM. I did. Well, that? first of all, I was being a pro-dom, so I was being paid to hit people. I was also being paid to do shows at Hellfire. Um, and I wrote on BDSM for my honours thesis. Let's, let's come back let's yeah, come right. to that in a little bit because that, that is a very fascinating piece and I want to yeah, give right. it a proper time. 
but is, is th this paid enough that you were able to do all your courses? Well, you know, I was also in receipt of a government, um, a government payment for being uh, unable to live with my parents. Eventually, uh, I got my parents to sign a something to say my house was violent and I couldn't live there. So I got a living away from home allowance, uh, okay. which basically paid for the rent and nothing more living in Sydney. Sydney is one of the most expensive places to live um, in terms of cost of living. Um, so I would do sessions, I would do shows, I would, I mean, there was a magazine called Paddles and I would go on dates with men and they'd, you know, like it would be like straight white men, they're going, oh, I want to spank your body, body over dinner. And I'd be like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Go, can you hand me your underwear? Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I mean, those are the things that I guess, you know, again, in terms of looking for people painted black, I, sex work, uh, dominatrix, I, I, I looked everywhere. I, I wanted to see who the people were that society tells us are bad people. And I have to say I liked them all. So was there anyone in the, all of this work that completely repulsed you, that you found awful? Look, from time to time in every scene or community you meet people that you don't get along with or that you don't find um, ethical. Um, I'm really bad on bullying. I don't like people that bully. I don't like people that hurt people who have less power than them. So those kind of people get my back up. I also, I think that there's a tendency sometimes for some mediocre men to be attracted to the idea of being a master because they can't succeed as men. Um, so that they think that if they put on a master hat, that's suddenly going to give yeah. them some sort of rights and authority. And um, they've often caught my ire. <laughs> um, because I just don't, I don't think that that's an, <laughs> Dominance is not something that you put on with a hat. Right. Um, and also, I guess one of the things I've always done in terms of educating young people that come to Hellfire is to go, you don't have to choose what you are. Just because somebody tells you you're a sub and puts a collar on you, that doesn't mean that that's what you are. You've got choices here. If this is not fun, stop it. Yeah. 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 You know, there was one that really, like, I had a sub bring me, I think we were out of town, like, we were driving up the highway and she's like, you know, my master's going to get my pussy pierced six times and I don't want all the metal on, on my pussy. And I was like, well, then say no. <laughs> like, it's not a requirement, you know. Yeah. And, and BDSM needs to be negotiated. And just because you have this fun sex game going on doesn't mean at times you don't have to step outside it and be an adult and actually say, actually, I need to talk to you in a normal voice now, not as my master, and this is not fun for me, and I'm not finding it fun, and we need to set some limits and boundaries. Yeah, yeah. But you said you've whipped half of Sydney. I have whipped half of Sydney. <laughs> so tell us a bit about that. Okay, for the first eight years, Hellfire was um, a club where there was a very small portion of community, um, and we did shows for a wide audience. One night we hit 1,600 people. That was our biggest. I had to whip like this because I couldn't move my arms because <laughs> the people were oh, in so, so close. Yeah. Um, so I've whipped the local constabulary. I've, um, yeah, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and went, do you know that you're assaulting a police officer? I'm like, shit, shit, no, no, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we used to take audience volunteers. Um, we've been through licensing court a few times because apparently if somebody plays to get into a venue and then I whip them. I'm performing a sex act on them, so I'm soliciting on licensed premises. Um, oh. So we've had a lot of our shows filmed by chess cameras. Um, so eventually um, we, we ran a system where the person would tell me the month before or the week before, at that point we're weekly, um, tell me the week before that they wanted to be whipped. So I'd put them on the door list so that they, they weren't paying, so that they, they didn't, I didn't solicit. Oh. But yeah, we, we ran each night. I would whip eight to 10 to 15 people. We would just, we'd have three tops working and we'd just go through them. And so I'd be walking up to people in the audience and going, hi, would you like to get whipped tonight? <laughs> <laughs> or they'd come to you tell you that you can't anally rape them. And it's like, well, have you seen anyone else get anal sex? We charge a lot more for that. On you go. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently that's straight men's biggest fear, um, that somebody's going to touch their freckle. <laughs> a 
I'm like, we tie you up with your pants on. It's gonna, they're gonna stay on. It's gonna be okay. Oh. <laughs> so yeah. So in that time period, I whipped a lot of people. <laughs> But the police officer clearly was enjoying this. Yes, it the was police not... officer was enjoying They used to yeah. use Hellfire as their off night, like when they'd come and... And they would actually be really difficult. Like they would be really um, like inappropriate in the venue. They were really hard work. What do you mean? Well, like, you know, they'd grab subs and, you know, get a punch in the face from one of our subs, oh. you know. I mean, <laughs> we had to hold our ground there because it was, you know, whipping for the general public. Yeah. I whipped Pantera, the band. They were so off their heads that they were shaking the A-frame and I picked up the nastiest whip I had and I'm like, these are your kidneys, right? I'm going to hit you there unless you stop. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, it's, yeah, we, we've whipped all sorts of people. We've whipped, um, we whipped for Madonna. Uh, Madonna came out. She actually doesn't like BDSM. Um, she was like, oh, don't hurt her. Because <laughs> our subs all wanted to go really hard because it was for Madonna. Yeah. Yeah. We whipped um, Robert De Costella, who is um, a marathon runner. We taught Richard Roxburgh to hit to hit to whip for um, uh, his movie Passion, where he was playing somebody that used to do BDSM. Yeah, we, we've done a, we've done a lot of whipping. <laughs> My gosh! <laughs> but you also worked at a porn magazine. Tell us yeah, a little about that. Yeah, I did thirteen that. years as the editor of Wet Set. <coughs> which was a pissing, and be, uh, a pissing and adult baby magazine, which um, was what I used while I was going through uni um, because I didn't want to be a waitress. Mm -hmm. um, so I've edited a lot more pee than any person has, ever has a right to. <laughs> and I've done a lot of public shoots in really inappropriate places like the Sydney Opera House, Milson's Point Station, of women peeing their pants up the escalators <laughs> in Broadway shopping centre. <laughs> you name it, we've done it. <laughs> it just felt like an extension on Hellfire, really. <laughs> oh my gosh. But you, you've told me that Hellfire is a club where no one fits in, so everyone fits in. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, I mean that we don't pitch at the Body Beautiful, the Tom of Finland. We don't we don't say what you have to be like so, and we try to do this in a whole variety of ways so firstly we choose the poster from um the people that come the month before yes. so it's a real person um that comes and at the beginning we meddled and we would choose like normally you pick the best photo and a, a normal club marketing would pick the, the photo that's going to get the most people in sure. we've never done that we've picked people because we wanted to make older women feel like the place it was a place for them butch women um, fat women skinny women small women so at the beginning we would meddle and we'd go we had a fat fat blonde last time we're going to have a skinny redhead with tattoos this time and so we would kind of make sure that we got balanced that way now we just pick the best photo because what we learned was that when you meddle and when you give people alternative images of beauty all people start to feel beautiful in your club. Yeah. So they learn, they, they learn the confidence because actually what sells a poster is somebody feeling very confident. Yeah. So that yeah. what we found, and then I realized that we had to stop meddling. It was one night and there was this girl and she just looked absolutely beautiful. She'd probably been about a size six, which is really kind of petite in Australian sizes. Um, and she came up to me and I, she, she was standing there by herself and I said, oh, you look really beautiful in your corset. And she said, oh, I know I don't fill it out like I should. And I felt absolutely horrified. I was like, if we've made you feel like you're not wearing a corset properly, we've gone too far and we need to take uh, the meddling out uh, because all women can look beautiful in a corset. Yeah. So, yeah, so it, at first it was meddling, now it's not. We also, um, through our amazing sponsors, Sax, um, sax Leather, a uh, Sax Fetish, sorry, we... We've run a DIY prize for the last, I think, eight years. So every month we give a gift voucher of $100 for a leather shop um, to somebody who makes their own outfit. Oh. And by letting Crap Craft, as I call it, letting Crap Craft win, we've actually, I think, I, I, I guess people have seen, and because we do a photo before, so we, we show the winner, we show the prize, and then we, you know, we show who won. So. A, so people see that we do give it to different people and it's not just a cliquey thing. Yeah. But B, so people get inspired and feel good if they have wrapped themselves in guard wrap or 
if they've made their own <laughs> outfit, you know, their own tin foil hat. So I think in those kind of ways, we really, we really resist being about who has the most money and who has the prettiest looks. You've also said that Hellfire is very good about welcoming new people. Oh yeah, and the young newcomers. People. Look, uh, I'm not trying to be mean, but older fetish crowds can be really difficult. If they don't like something, that's yeah. all you hear about. Yeah. Um, whereas the newcomers, it's all new and it's all exciting and they've never fitted in before and they're so happy to be there and they didn't know that they could dress like that. Or So, I mean, they're actually my favorites. But we, we used to allow them, when they signed up for a mailing list, we used to get a, um, we'd, we'd give them a box where they could tell us something if they wanted to tell oh, us. Oh, oh. And they all was like, I've never found a club where I've fitted in before. And it was such a repeated piece of text that we kind of laughed because they can't all be the ones that we're putting the club on for. So that's how we came up with the line, the club where nobody fits in, so everybody does. You also said that, um Pansexual attendance mm -hmm. greatly benefits Hellfire. How was that? Well, I think it forced everyone to get along. I mean, we've had an evolving set of rules for quite some time. And I mean, I've, I've been the person writing them. So I can tell you that we struggled a lot more. We had a lot of lesbians come at one stage and the straight men's behavior was difficult. So I, at that point, the rules said, treat every woman as if she is a lesbian because she probably is. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and I just wanted them to have that hesitancy um, rather than going, hey, how about it? We, we gave a lot of rules that are about how to have a conversation with somebody that's not, I want to suck your cock. Like, you, you, you need to be able to have tools to talk to people. So that's one of the reasons we've always sat on a dress code. It hasn't oh, had to be leather, yeah. but it's like if somebody is dressed up as a French maid, you can go up to them and say, hello, you look like a lovely maid. And that's, that's a conversation starter as opposed to a come on. Yeah. And I think by giving people those tools, we encourage conversation and then sex happens. Uh -huh. But it's like you get a, you get a friendly a club, you get a, you get a club where people ask your fetish before they ask you to do their fetish. Okay, fascinating. But you've also said it, Hellfire's like the McDonald's of BDSM. Oh, yeah. what, what do you mean by that? Meat and beat, like we're, we're, we're quick. Yeah. You know, uh, we, don't, we don't stand on too much ceremony. There aren't too many rules. We, we're open to people experimenting. We like people coming and seeing if it's for them. Um, if they want more, we, are a good funnel to all of the other events. Um, we don't, uh, I actually think that if they're gonna have the right, a journey through BDSM, they, they are going to go to other events. So we've always been happy being the first point of contact. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. So that's, a, you know, so I guess I, I, I have a wide catchment, so I think BDSM is very wide. Um, but if they want really specific things, we then funnel them off to other parties. And often the party promoters, like we've had really good relationships with most of the party promoters. And so they come. So I go, well, let me introduce you to this person and maybe you can talk to them about their private party because obviously you want more than we can give you. Yeah. yeah. How do new trends and, and influences uh, affect Hellfire? Um, look, you get, you get enthusiastic um, uptake at different times. I think we've had conservative governments being really helpful because the more conservative society is, the more people feel like they want to rebel. So I think we do better under a liberal government than we do under a Labor government, sure. except for the lockout laws, which you know have impacted everybody pretty heavily. Um, I think um, maybe Maybe, maybe Master Sir kind of stuff came out as a response to HIV, but I think now as a response to the sort of the alienation that people feel in society, we see the puppy pack really having developed. So I think that we certainly see trends overall. Yeah. Um, latex was very strong for a while. We had a very big rope community for a while. Um, uh, I started to miss people actually being hit for a while because there was so much growth. <laughs> <rope. laughs> but unfortunately, Hellfire is 
shutting down. I what's, know. what's going on with that? Look, our current venue has um, gotten a bit big um, and they want a lot more money and a small community event can't, like, we, we just can't guarantee that the bar will make what they want us to make. And we've moved four times, no, five times in the last two years. And oh each God. time it's, it's terrible. Like half the community hates the new venue, half the community loves the old venue and will never come. And this isn't the right place to do BDSM. And I don't feel comfortable <laughs> wearing my fetish clothes in Darling Harbour, it's a family place. And it's like there, there's less and less places that we could possibly hold an, an event of our size. And also we have to break a new venue into BDSM every single time. So that means talking to security until they don't feel uncomfortable. It means making sure, you know, making sure everything, like we, we try to tell them that we're gonna need a big coat check. I mean a big yeah. coat check. Lots of people wear very little clothing in the venue, they're gonna need a coat check. And every time the first coat check is an absolute clusterfuck, like it's, it's just no. terrible and there's nothing you can do. You can warn a venue every time. So there are, changing is, is hard and we've been doing this for um, 26 years and nine months, I think. My or, gosh. Yeah. Okay. So I was 19 when we first started. I'm now 45. Um, it's a long time. I, I don't even know what it would be, what it's going to be like to not have Hellfire. But um, I think this time we've had enough and we want to do three really good parties. So we had one um, earlier this weekend, um, which went really, really well. And it had a really euphoric feeling and lots of the old, um, old Hellfire crowd came. Because when you've been doing something for 26 years, you, you meet generations of yes. kinksters. Yes, um, you would. I remember a woman coming in and said, have you met my daughter? And she pointed into the middle of the dance floor and I'm like, oh, you mean that woman with her, with her top off, you know, and she looked, you know, quite um, intoxicated and she's like, yes. And she <laughs> goes, I can tell you're a little bit shocked. And I'm like, I am a little bit shocked. And she said, do you know what? This is the safest club in Sydney because if I'm not looking after her, you are. And I went, yep, you probably got me. I am. I am looking after her. Um, so, yeah, so we, we've seen their kids. There was another time where there was a man filming a show and I'm like, you can't film the performer. Um, and then he's like, yes, I can. It's my daughter. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, well, that, after the show, I will provide you with a DVD of her titties, but you can't film them in the club. Sorry. So it's been, a, it's been an interesting to do something sexual, like to do something that's so much about sexuality. You don't think it's going to be about family, but it turns out that if your parents love something, they might pass that love on to you. But speaking of love, you wrote your uh, master's thesis, is that correct? Yeah. On Operation Spanner. I did. So tell us about that. And maybe <laughs> briefly explain it for people who don't know what that was. Um, I wanted to write on, t on BDSM and I was um, a women's studies major and a philosophy major. And I'd heard about a case in um, the UK where a bunch of men were prosecuted um, for doing BDSM with each other um, in a party, in a private party. And of course, this is at the time things that I'd done. And not only were the people that were hurting others prosecuted, the people that allowed people to hurt them were yeah. prosecuted. And that shocked me, the idea that you couldn't consent to harm to your own body. Um, and I could think of a lot of other ways in which people often consent to harm to their own body. You let a surgeon chop you up um, and that can go wrong. You go, go into a boxing ring and that can go wrong. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to write a thesis about what, what happens when people consent to harm on their own, on, on their own body in a, in a sadomasochistic context. And essentially what I came up with was that when our cases go through the courts, we invariably have a very hard time because they don't understand the rules of engagement in our subculture. And that's exactly the same as a boxing match. I don't understand the rules of engagement. It right. looks like violence to me. So essentially, I advocated for having a court where experts, BDSM experts, were um, brought in on cases when harm happened. What's the biggest misconception about you? 
Oh, everyone thinks that I'm, you know, hard to approach or a bit of a bitch. Um, but I think that when you run a nightclub, you have to be able to throw, away, throw out a drunk man who's arguing with you. So you actually do have to have a bit of pres a presence. Um, and I like my, I think my people find me. So if they're not brave enough to walk over, they're not my people. So I don't mind. Well, Jackie Ultra, thank you for thank an you. amazing fireside chat. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs>